Hello, good evening. Happy a Wednesday. So we're going to read chapter three or measure three tonight, which is entitled articulation slash duration. Every time you move and every time you play a note, a piece of yourself is left behind. We played for hours, just the two of us having fun. I don't remember the last time I'd done that without expecting to get paid. Eager to learn more, I asked Michael to teach me about the other other elements of music. Soon, he answered. I have more to show you about notes first. Let's look at them in a different way before we call it a night. How we view notes provides a good example of how we view life. How we view life? What do you mean? He played a C and a C sharp at the same time on the guitar. How does that sound? He asked. Awful. It sounds like two notes clashing. I responded with a grimace. Very ordinary answer, he said matter-of-factly. Now, if I take the C up an octave and play the two notes again, what does it sound like now? Now it sounds pretty, I answered. The C became the major seventh, which is a key factor in making a chord sound pretty. That's cool. Correct, he said. The rule book tells us that two notes played side by side, a half step apart, should clash and sound dissonant. But if we move the lower note up an octave, the same two notes sound pretty. Why is that? They are the same two notes. How can they clash in one instance and sound pretty in the next? There is a life lesson in, in there somewhere. Interesting, I thought. Hey, F. Hey, F. <laughs> Hello, I love you. Oh my gosh. Dude, you totally inspired me. I did all of my laundry. I don't know if there's ever been a year in my life ever that all my laundry has been cleaned. All the stuff on my body right now is cleaned. I even cleaned the stuff on my body. In fact, my stuff's at the laundromat right now drying. Um, so yeah, after I finish this chapter, I'll pop over and snag it. But dude, thank you. All right, back to the book. Interesting, I thought. And then he continues out loud. So are, you, so are you saying that situations in life which seem to clash may not be wrong at all? They may just be in the wrong octave? It is you who is saying that, but I do agree. Keep going with that thought. Okay, I've never thought about it before, but I'll give it a try. How about this? If we can learn to change our perspective and see negative things in a different octave, we may be able to see the beauty in all things and in all situations. Bravo! I'll accept that. Very articulate, simple, and to the point. All situations and all people contain beauty, but it is up to us to see it. When we don't see it, our immediate response is to blame then change the outer thing rather than change our perspective or our octave. It is only when we change our octave that we can see things as they really are. Then, and only then, can we make a positive change when and where it needs to be made. Dude, Mr. Hugh, welcome, bros. Yay, welcome, everyone. Dudes, this book is juicy. I love it. <clears throat> that was awesome. Once again, I was learning new things about music and life. I was fascinated by the way he paralleled the two. I didn't know what I was getting myself into when I originally agreed to take part in this situation. But if he really meant it when he told me that he could teach me nothing, he sure had me fooled. Even though I'd just met him, he was already the best teacher I'd ever known, bringing out parts of me I never knew existed. Here's another way to look at these two notes, he continued. Let's say that we don't change the octave for the C or the C sharp. Let's just surround these two notes with other notes and see what happens. If you, if you play a B flat, a C, a D flat, which is the same as the C sharp, an F and an A flat, you have a B flat minor nine chord. Now the C and the C sharp sound good even though they are right next to each other and in the same register. People could learn a life lesson from music if they could just choose to see. 
he began to sing. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. Johnny Nash, I responded, recognizing the lyric. That's a beautiful song. He nodded in agreement. Also, he continued, in the key of B flat minor, the rule book tells us that we are not allowed to play a C sharp. But when I, when I play it, it sounds good to me. We're supposed to call it a D flat, even though they are the same note. We can play one, but not the other. It's all in the name, I guess. Rules. <laughs> Tom, yay! Hey, everybody, welcome. This is so cool. <clears throat> they can be confusing sometimes, I added. Michael told me that once the rules were thoroughly learned, they could be thoroughly broken. He said that the same was true with life's rules. I eventually witnessed him break or bend rules many times. Most of the time, I hadn't even realized what the rule was. I just knew that one or two of them were being broken. He also told me that the beauty of the world could be seen through music. There is always beauty to be found, and it is necessary to find it in all things and in all people if real change is to be made in this world, he said. He seemed to think that what we see in life and what we hear in music are simply our choice, and that when things start to look grim, that is when we really need to find the beauty. I remember him I remember his telling me it is always easier to build upon this beauty than it is to pretend it is not there and try to create it from scratch. That is a comment I will never forget. I've had many music lessons in my life, but never before had I experienced anything quite like Michael. None of my teachers had ever shown life through music in a way that I could clearly understand. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even though I didn't totally understand Michael, he made things clearer than they had ever appeared before, and he wasn't finished. He was just getting started. He played two more notes on the guitar and asked me how they sounded. Again, they seemed to clash, but this time I was afraid to say so. He could tell by my expression what I was thinking. Next, he played what sounded like two different notes. I could hear a slight wobble as they vibrated against each other. These two notes sounded better, and I told him so. He told me that they were the same two notes. He didn't. Be I didn't believe him. Those were the same notes, I asked. Absolutely, he responded. I just articulated them differently the second time. I also held them a bit longer. Changing the duration allows your ear to hear and respond differently. Wait a minute, I said. You're telling me that the way you played the notes caused them to sound different? I mean, even the pitch sounded different. Michael didn't respond. He just walked over to my bookshelf, pulled out another CD, and placed it in the player. With the remote in his hand, he sat down and looked at me in silence. I had no idea what he was up to or what his musical choice would be this time. The anticipation was starting to build. He just sat there, staring at me with his sly grin. When I knew that I was uncomfortable, <clears throat> when he knew that I was uncomfortable enough, he pointed the remote and pressed play. <laughs> The music that came out of the speakers shocked me. I didn't know who it was. It was a CD I surely didn't believe to be part of my collection. It felt like Michael was trying to torture me. The music was, well, it was bluegrass. I hate bluegrass, bluegrass music, I cried out. All the talk about beauty, and that's all you have to say, was his response. Dude. It's like Michael knew. <laughs> Well, that's the first thing that came to mind. What are you talking about? Michael asked, pressing pause on the remote. Bluegrass, I said. No, you are not talking about bluegrass. You are talking about yourself. Michael leaned forward as he spoke. His dark eyebrows nearly touched, nearly touched each other as he narrowed his gaze. Listen to what you are saying. I hate bluegrass music. You were talking about you, but blaming your lack of perception on this particular style of music. <laughs> Even though he was right, I felt as though as I was I felt as though he was attacking me, and he didn't stop. He continued his assault. We do the same with people. All music, like all people, contains beauty and a soul. 
For you not to recognize it is not music's fault. It is you we are talking about. It is you who does not recognize. There are millions of people who love this music. Are you here to tell me that all these people are wrong? I'm not saying that they're wrong. I just don't like bluegrass music. Who are you talking about? He asked. Me. Good. More progress. Michael sat back and closed his eyes, smiling as if he'd just won a battle. Without looking, he pushed play and nodded his head at me. I started to pick up my bass so I could play along, but with his eyes still closed, he tucked his long hair behind his right ear and whispered, listen, just listen. I didn't know what he wanted me to listen for, but I figured that if I acted like him, maybe I could listen like him. So I leaned back, so I leaned back and closed my eyes too. After a few minutes, Michael spoke. Blue Moon of Kentucky by Bill Monroe. He is the father of bluegrass music. Listen to the bass on this track. Can you play like that? Of course I can. Country music is easy to play. One, five, one, four. No problem. First of all, this is bluegrass. There's a difference. It is closely related to music, or it is closely related to country music, but it is also related to jazz. They're kissing cousins. You may not hear it yet, but you will one day. Some of the best improvisers on the planet play bluegrass, and playing it may not be as simple as you think. I'm always surprised when people don't like bluegrass. <laughs> This guy is so cool. Maybe he likes it now. But hey, to each, to each their own. <clears throat> now, I admit that I hadn't listened to much bluegrass or country music in the past, so maybe he was right. I couldn't hear it. But there was one point I felt I really felt he was wrong about. I knew this type of music was easy to play, no matter what he said. It only took a few minutes for me to realize that. Once again, Michael was right. He introduced me to the nuances of the music by asking me to pay close attention to how the bass player articulated each note in that particular song. There was much more to Mr. Monroe's music than I'd previously realized. I didn't know how to feel about that. Notice how each note starts and ends, he instructed. Listen to the way he attacks each note and notice whether the notes are long, short, or in between. Recognize the life of each note. Can you hear the beginning, middle, and end of each one? If he had articulated differently or changed the duration of any note, would that have changed the feel of the song? Listen. Again, Michael sat back and closed his eyes, so I did the same. I tried to pay attention to the life of each note. The song was in 3-4. I noticed that the bass player was playing whole notes, except that he didn't let each note ring for its full duration. He would cut them off just before each downbeat. I also re realized that if the notes had been any shorter, the song would have been a little more bounce, or the song would have had a little more bounce. And if they were any longer, the song would have felt slower. The relationship between the slow 3-4 time signature and Bill's rhythmic way of singing gave the song an interesting feel. Also, the attack of the acoustic bass felt different than an electric bass would have felt. How the bass player played each note helped dictate the feel of the song. It made me think of how I usually approached my notes. I rarely let them ring. I usually attacked them hard and fast. I thought about each note having a life, as Michael had alluded. I used that word alluded today, alluding to this book. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to the bass player caused me to realize that I rarely gave my notes enough air. But the most amazing thing was that in allowing myself to listen to Bill Monroe so deeply, I enjoyed his music, if only slightly. I opened my eyes and noticed Michael staring at me. Stopping the music, he asked a strange question. You ever read Horton Hears a Who? <laughs> I love Horton. I didn't know what that had to do with anything, but understanding that Michael had his own way of teaching, I answered him, of course I have, Dr. Seuss. Do you remember what that poor elephant found on the little speck of dust? There was a whole civilization living on it. 
I answered. Exactly, he said, pointing at me. Notes are the same. If you listen closely, you can find a whole world living inside each one. Notes are alive, and like you and me, they need to breathe. The song will dictate how much air is needed. There is no rule, hard and fast, but usually, the sharper the attack, the shorter the sustain, and vice versa is also true. Now, here's what I want you to do this time. Breathe with the music. Listen to the song one more time and take a breath with each note as the bass player plays. It will help you understand what I'm talking about. Damn, Bean! This is like golden. After that, I want you to play along with the song, breathing with your own bass notes. If you change the length of your notes, you must also change the length of your breath. Do, do that and pay attention to what it does to you and to music. Don't go to sleep tonight until you have done it at least twice. We will continue tomorrow. I will leave my bag here if that's okay with you. <laughs> what a weirdo. This is so cool. Without waiting for a response, Michael put on his helmet, pulled down the face shield, turned, and walked out the front door, skateboard in hand. For a time, I just sat there, staring at the closed door, reflecting on the many things the strange man had said. I'd already learned so much from him. It was hard to believe that we'd met for the first time earlier that day. Breathe with the music, he had instructed. What did he mean? I'd never listened to or played music in such a fashion. But once I did, as he suggested, things started to change. Breathing with the music caused me to hear it and feel it. Oh my God, I'm having an epiphany here. Just because, you know, like, sp sp spiritus, the breath, spirit. <sighs> It's like when you're working out. Okay. <clears throat> Damn, that's so good. Okay. I guess I was... Wait. <laughs> the epiphany was given to me, or is that the way it works? You can't be taught anything. You have to learn it for yourself. <laughs> okay. Um, but once I did as he'd suggested... Things started to change. Breathing with the music caused me to hear it and feel it in a way I never had before. I could actually feel the notes mixing with my heartbeat. It was like a meditation. I don't know if it was my slow ry rhythmic breathing or what, but whatever it was helped me to begin to understand Mr. Monroe's m music for the first time. And I have to say, and I hate to say it, but I liked it. That Michael, he was a sneaky character. At least 10 minutes had gone by before I realized I was actually learning how to play a bluegrass song. In order to play along while breathing with my notes, I had to learn the music. He tricked me into doing something I would have outright refused to do if I'd been asked. I knew that he must have been smiling right about then. I was. <laughs> As I got up to go to bed, I saw Michael's bag lying on the floor, as if it had fallen off of the arm of the chair. Sticking halfway out of the bag was a book. I tried to leave it alone, but what I could see of the title made me curious. The Science and Art of... I couldn't see the rest, but I really wanted to. I wasn't sure whether I should remove the book from his bag or not. <clears throat> I didn't want to go through his stuff, but the book was already halfway out, and my curiosity was getting the best of me. I don't know why, but it was. Just peeking at the title wouldn't be wrong, right? I tried to distract myself by going into the bathroom to brush my teeth, but it didn't work. The science of art... The science and art of... Of what? I asked out loud. Okay, just a quick look, I told myself. I practically ran from the bathroom to the bag. I guess I was secretly hoping for something different, but the bag was still laying there in the exact same place with the book poking halfway out. Michael is so peculiar, I thought, trying to come up with an excuse. I may never see him again anyway. Plus, he might have left it here on purpose just for me to find. I convinced myself a quick glance would be all right. The Science and Art of Tracking by Tom Brown Jr. I was confused. It was a book on animal and human tracking. I couldn't quite fathom what Michael was doing with a book about footprints. 
but it looked interesting. Footprints. Where we've been, where we're going. Trekking was an interest that I had held since my childhood days of pretending to be a spy, but I never really learned much about, much about it. I'm familiar with the trumpet player named Tom Brown, and quite frankly, even though I love his music, I'm not sure if I would have read a book about him. But Tom Brown Jr., the tracker? Hmm, let's see. About an hour later, I forced myself to stop reading, not wanting Michael to know I'd touched his things. I put the book back using my best James Bond spy skills. He'll never know, I whispered to myself, as if someone might hear. With my mind tired and full, I went to sleep and slept hard. For a little while, anyway. Did he finish the exercise? <clears throat> I awoke to the sound of banging on my front door. I looked at the clock. 5.15 a.m. I don't know any musician who gets up at 5.15 in the morning. So I rolled over and tried to go back to sleep. Then I heard his voice. Let me in. Let me in. I can't find the key. I could hear him laughing through the door. <laughs> I got up and opened the door. I had to admit that Michael was funny, but I wasn't going to encourage him by cracking even a faint smile. I gave him my best sleepy look. He didn't seem to care. He waltzed right in wearing a pair of brown shorts, a forest green shirt, large black boots, and a tan safari hat. <laughs> Around his waist was a small pack, and he was carrying his skateboard, under, his skateboard under his left arm. Time to go, he said. I couldn't imagine going anywhere that early except back to sleep. Go where? I asked. Tracking, but we have to move quickly. The sun is just starting to rise, and it will be at the perfect angle soon. Did you read the book? Uh, no, I didn't. What book? I didn't plan to lie. The words just popped out of my mouth. I also didn't know what to think. He was baiting me with the book. Or were my spy skills that lacking? He looked at me and smiled one of his now-familiar Cheshire cat grins. Picking up a shirt from the floor, he threw it at me and turned toward the door. Let's go. Slowly starting to wake up, I put on the shirt and followed him. You got room on that board for me? I asked with a chuckle. It might take longer, but we would see much more, he responded in all seriousness. We hopped in my car and drove west on Interstate 40. Nashville is the type of city that attracts people from all over the country, especially musicians. It's not too big or too small. This allows people from larger cities, such as Los Angeles or New York, to sell their small homes, move to Nashville, buy larger ones with lots of land, and still not be too far away from city life. I like it because you only have to drive a few minutes to be surrounded by trees. I've always loved spending time in the woods, but my musical life never allowed me the opportunity. At least, that's what my excuse had always been. I dreamed of someday owning a log cabin in the woods. We drove down a beautiful winding road in Cheatham, Cheatham County, and was flanked by rolling hills on the east and the long, narrow Harpeth River on the right, or on the west. <laughs> the scenery was beautiful at that time of day, the low morning sun shining through the trees and reflecting off the remaining white oak and hickory, hickory leaves filled the air with magic. I want to read that again. The low morning sun shining through the trees and reflecting off the remaining white oak and hickory leaves filled the air with magic. The dark rippling river slithered and twisted like a snake, tempting us to take a bite of the forbidden fruit that lay just on the other side. I was instructed to park the car on the right side of the road near one of the bends in the river. Then we walked up a steep, rarely used trail to the top of Mace Bluff. Mace Bluff is a tall hill covered in scrub pine and cedar trees that overlook the river. The ground cover, mostly poison ivy, is so thick it acts like a barrier protecting the mountain. Few, uh, few causal strollers, oh, that says casual, <laughs> few casual strollers would risk a trek through it. At the top of the hill is a low-sitting flat rock with a carving in the center. 
This ancient carving is known as the Mace Bluff Petroglyph. Research researchers have wondered about the carvings about the carving for years, but have never come to a conclusion as to what it is. All they know is that its origins are Native American and that it is hundreds of years old. All I know is that the panoramic view from the top of the bluff is breathtaking. Michael stood with his eyes closed and his hands raised above his head. He took three slow, deep breaths. I didn't know what I was supposed to do, so I just stood there watching. I could tell that this was a sacred place to him, and I waited for him to tell me about it. I especially wanted to know about the carving in the rock. Instead, when he was finished breathing, he sat down on top of the carving as if it weren't there and pointed across the river. Look, he said, through the trees. That is an area called Mount Bottom. Or no, no, Mound Bottom. <clears throat> With a D. It was a sacred place used by Native Americans hundreds of years ago. Some of these natives still come back to that place today. I didn't, if, I didn't know if he was talking about living Native Americans or spirits from the distant past. I hadn't seen Native, uh, many Native Americans in Nashville, so if spirits were still hanging around, I wondered how we could know. Could he see them, feel them, or was he just playing with my mind again? He was supposed to be teaching me music anyway so I didn't ask. I counted 13 different sized mounds surrounding one big mound situated in the middle. The big one was said to be at least 20 feet high. They were spread across a broad open field, and from our vantage point, they looked as if they were but small bumps on the land. It was hard to believe that they were really that large. Those are notes, big notes, Michael said, nodding across the river to the mounds. What do you mean? I asked. Signs left by the native people. Those mounds are like big notes, but you have to be far away from them in order to read them as a group. Tom Brown Jr. is a tracker, so he would call them tracks. I am a musician, so I call them notes. If a good tracker can tell a lot about the people who left those tracks, a good musician should be able to do the same. After a few minutes of musical mound comp contemplation, Michael broke the silence. Reading tracks is like reading music, just as making tracks is like making music. There is no way to move across the landscape without leaving tracks. It matters not whether it matters not whether it is a natural landscape or a musical or a musical one. Every time you move and every time you play a note, a piece of yourself is left behind. There is no way to avoid that. Now the tracker, he explained, continuing to gaze upon the field. If he is a good one, he can see right into the soul of whoever left the tracks. The tracker can tell what the creator of the tracks was thinking, feeling, doing, and more. A good musician should be able to do the same. To learn how to do that takes time, dedication, and intuition. But since you can read music already, it should come to you easily. I heard of reading palms, tea leaves, hair follicles, and eyes, and Brown's book even talked about reading tracks, but never before had I heard of reading music, at least not in this way. Take a, look, take a good look at these mounds, Michael instructed, waving his hand across the horizon. Seeing them as a whole is a lot like looking at a piece of music. A good reader can get an idea of what a piece of music sounds like just by looking at the whole chart. Now, to get more detail from the music, we need to move closer. Let's go. Without hesitation, he took off running down the hill. He bounced down the small mountain like a deer, and I tried my best to keep up. By the time I made it to the bottom, Michael was already crossing the river and heading over to the mounds. When I finally caught up with him, he was standing on top of a large mound, which I now noticed was flattened. <clears throat> Excuse me one second. When I finally caught up with him, he was standing on top of the large mound, which I now noticed was flattened on the top, forming a small plateau. 
From this vantage point, we could clearly see how the smaller mounds were situated in a horseshoe shape around the larger mound, the largest mound. The key, Michael stated. What? The key, you found it. You are standing on it. Can you see how this mound is like the key center of a piece of music? Anyway, can you see how this mound is like the key center of a piece of music? Everything else is here to support this larger mound. I see, I replied, struggling to understand. Let me try. The large mound we are standing on is like the key of the song. All the other mounds are here to help define what that key is. This large mound had to be established first before the other mounds, or let me say the other notes could be placed. It's clear, standing here in the center, that the smaller mounds are here to help support this larger one. So, relating these mounds to music, I can see that the first thing to do is establish a key. How is that? Very good, he answered. But like I mentioned before, the first thing might not be the key. Right, the groove. But in this situation, we're talking about mounds. Wait a minute. Are you saying that the natives first established a groove before building the mounds? Yes! How so? I imagine native people dancing to the music while building the mounds. I knew that wasn't what he was talking about, but I couldn't make the connection, at least not yet. What did they think about before placing the mounds here? He asked. I tried to come up with an answer, but the pure act of trying seemed to push it away. I don't know. You search for answers the way you search for notes. Let go of the need to be in charge, Michael instructed. I didn't quite grasp what he was talking about, but I did try to relax. It didn't help. I still couldn't find the answer. Can you give me a hint? I asked. Tomorrow we will build an exact replica of this mound in your backyard, okay? Why? I asked, not following his logic. Finally, I thought you would never get the answer. <laughs> what are you talking about? I was really confused. You don't even get the answers when they come to you. Maybe you are more pitiful than I thought, Michael lowered his head. I could tell he was trying to conceal his laughter by the way his head bounced. I threw my hands up in frustration. I still don't get it. Why? Michael blurted. Feeling more than frustrated, I had to keep myself from shouting. I don't know why. No, listen. They needed a why. A reason before they placed the mounds. They didn't just decide to place the mounds in this specific area one day. They had a reason for doing it. Then they decided where to place them. Where to place the mounds is the key. Why to place them in the first place is the groove. Boom. Okay, now I get it. I breathed a heavy sigh of relief. That should have been easy. Of course they had a reason to place the mounds here. They needed a reason why before they decided where to place them. And not the other way around. I understand that clearly now. Yes, and now you can see how purpose was their groove, right? He asked. Yes, I can. So what was their purpose for placing the mounds here? I asked. Let's look closer and see what ideas come to us. <laughs> I can't wait to hear. He reached in his waist pack and pulled out a handful of popsicle sticks. I had no idea what they were for. He started walking around the large mound, poking the sticks into the ground. By the time he was finished, there were rows of sticks going up and down the mound in all directions. Look here. What do you see? He was pointing at the ground. Grass, I answered, only half joking. He got down on his knees and motioned for me to do the same. Placing his hand in the grass, he parted the blades carefully. Think Tom Brown, he suggested. I answered immediately. A track. I see it. Yes, deer tracks on top of the mound out here in the open, he replied as he stood up. Each one of these rows of tracks, or each one of these rows of sticks, marks the trail of a different animal coming to the top of this mound. I see the sticks, but I'm having trouble seeing the tracks, I admitted. If you were in a room and tuned your mind to the color blue, every blue thing in the room would jump out at you. All you have to do here is tune your mind to the appearance of the track I just showed you. Then, like the color blue, the rest of the tracks will appear. 
I knew what he was talking about. I'd done it with colors many times before. I could cause myself to recognize any color in a room just by thinking of that color. As soon as I would focus my mind, everything in the room that was even close to the same color I was thinking of would stand out. By focusing on a different color, I could cause that color to stand out. I decided to try it with the track. <clears throat> I looked down and focused on the deer track at our feet. It was a shade darker than the rest of the grass. I unfocused my eyes and looked around the mound using my peripheral vision. To my surprise, I could see rows of little dark circles all over the mound. I see them, I exclaimed. Of course you do. There are animal tracks all over these mounds. Tell me this. Why do you think these animals are risking their safety to come here? There is no food or water here, and on top of the mound, they are out in the open where they do not like to be. What draws them to this location? Maybe there's something here for the animals that we don't see, I answered. Precisely. Michael responded with excitement. And maybe there was something there, or there was something here for the native people too. And maybe there's something here for us. We just can't see it. What we can't see, but we know is there, is usually called what? He asked. Spirit, I answered. Exactly. Spirit, the sensed but unseen. Music is the same. Can you see music? No. Then what is it really? I asked you. Buddy, yay! Oh my gosh, I really want you to hear this whole book. It's so good. Awesome. I think I'm getting real close to the end of the chapter here, but dude, I've been thinking, I really hope that you, that you listen to this one, Corey. It's so good. Oh, this is so good, man. This is so exciting. Okay. The mounds. Okay. Where am I? <laughs> I get excited. <laughs> okay. I think Corey's gone, but I'm still excited. <laughs> Music. Exactly. Spirit, the sensed, but un okay. unseen. Music is the same. Can you see music? No. Then what is it really, I ask you? I'd heard of the idea of music being spiritual, but he put it in a way that made sense to me. All of this, all of a sudden, without waiting for me to answer his last question, Michael ripped off his boots and took off down the hill, running on all fours like an animal. It was a hilarious sight. He bounced up and down, back and forth, turning and darting like he'd lost his mind. He scampered all over the mound. I'd seen squirrels act like that, but never a human. I could see the enjoyment on his face. His eyes beamed like a young pup's, seeing its first snow. It looked like fur to me, too, but I didn't have the courage to join him. Oh, it looked like fun, not fur. It looked like fun to me, too, but I didn't have the courage to join him. After removing the popsicle sticks from one of the rows, he laid them down beside each track, then mentioned for me to join him near the bottom of the hill. Of course, I walked. Look, he said, musical manuscript. What do you mean? I asked. If you allow the track to become the note and the stick to become the stem, each track will look like a musical note. You can then read the animal's gait pattern like a piece of music. Cool. Also, Michael added, noticing how the animal's feet attacked the ground will tell you even more about the animal. Usually the sharper the attack of each foot, the shorter the length of time it spends on the ground. This is a lot like music. I'd learned from the tracking book that gates were how you could tell whether the animal was moving fast or slow, and that looked and that looking at the edges of the track could tell you about the animal's direction and intention. After Michael showed me how to read each group of the deer tracks like a measure of music, I could do just that. I could tell instantly that the deer was galloping if the tracks sharply hit the ground in groups of four. Tracks in groups of two meant that the deer was moving more slowly. It came to me suddenly that the same is true in music. Four notes in a measure versus two notes in a measure lets you know how quickly the notes are moving, even at a glance. The fact that the deer ran across the field but walked on top of the open mound let me know that they were comfortable there. 
Paying attention to how the distinct edges of the deer hoofs hit the ground enabled me to tell in advance when the animal was going to change directions. I had no idea how Michael, how Michael could predict those direction changes before he showed me what to look for. Now, and now that I could do it, now that I could do it, I felt like Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> He showed me how to tell which way an animal was looking based on how its feet hit the ground. He also told me that if we looked deeper into the tracks, we could look deeper into the track maker. Michael believed that many internal things could be discerned about an animal or a human by studying his tracks. I didn't know what he meant by internal, but what he'd already shown me was enough. Being able to tell so much just by looking at the ground seemed magical to me. I could only imagine what it must be like having the ability to do the same thing by listening to someone's music. A sad person often plays music in a minor key, while a minor key might suggest a happy mood, or rather, while a major key might suggest a happy mood. That I already knew. I could even tell when a person was extremely nervous just by listening to his music. Maybe, like tracks, music is a doorway, allowing one to peek into a person's spirit. The thought of that was really intriguing. It was exciting to learn more. Or I was excited to learn more. Hey, hey, good to see you, Mike. Welcome in. Awesome. <clears throat> this is a spiritual place, Michael spoke, after we galloped our way back to the top of the hill. The natives know it. The animals know it. And now you know it. But what's your proof? How do you know that this is a spiritual place more than any other place? I inquired. Proof? What is proof but someone's perspective? And tell me, what importance does proof have anyway? Did you learn from the experience? Now that is important. But what makes it more spiritual than any other place? I asked. I didn't say this place was more spiritual than any other place, he continued. I said that it is a spiritual place and that the natives know it. Think about this. You looked at this place from high atop Mace Bluff and you saw beauty. You then came and stood atop the largest mound and you saw beauty. And now you look into the mound at the tracks of the animals that walk across her face and still you see beauty. Now close your eyes and tell me what you see. I did as he asked and again saw beauty. Good. From four different perspectives, you have viewed this wonderful place, and each view has generated the same feeling, beauty. How can you be wrong? Beauty is something you experience, not something you prove. Can you tell me what beauty is, or can you only give me your perspective on it? Can science define beauty? Can you see or touch it, or can you just see and touch something that possesses its quality? Beauty is invisible, individual, and intangible. Interesting, isn't it? It is something you know, yet technically it is not there. How can this be? Like music, it lives inside you, and you impress its qualities on whatever you choose. People have spoken about beauty for centuries. A wise man in the 1800s once said, the beautiful is that in which the many, still seen as many, become one. There is truth in that statement, but in simpler terms, it, be, it could be stated, as another wise man did. He wrote, beauty is truth. Truth, beauty. That is easily understandable. Standing up straight, he spread his arms wide and closed his eyes. The natives knew, and still know, that this is a spiritual place, because they choose it to be, and you have chosen the same. And nestled here, in the bend of the beautiful Harpeth River, you can see why. He quickly opened his eyes and leaned forward, asking me one last question. If this place is beautiful and beauty is invisible, then what is this place? A spiritual place, I exclaimed. Thank you. Now we can go. And that is the end of this chapter. Dudes, thank you so much for joining me with this. And thank you again, Victor. Thank you, Michael. I love you. I got to go. I have to bundle up. It became winter. It snowed. <laughs> I got to get myself to the laundromat to go fold my clothes up. Oh, man. I'm so thankful we did that. Oh, my gosh. He's a Grammy Award winner. 
not super. I don't even know who this guy is. I got to figure it out, right? I need to do some research. All right. I love yous. I'll see you soon. I don't know if I'll be here tomorrow. I have a big day, but I will be back sooner than later. I appreciate you. Mwah. Thank you so much. I'll see you so soon. Thank you.